We have to apologize this morning. We're under difficulties. I have had a strep throat for the last week. So the lecture will continue until the voice goes out, and that will be the end for the morning. <laughs> In the meantime, I'd like to also announce what I would normally announce at the end, not knowing when the end will arrive. <laughs> Namely, that my wife is with the Veritat Foundation is meeting here this afternoon at 1.30 to play a videotape that she made the Masonic Temple in uh, Sabona last week, week ten days ago. So uh, the public is invited. Now this morning we have a good subject. I'm sorry. I've asked to have the public address system as raised as much as possible. I hope you can hear. Have you been able to hear us up so far? Yes. Uh, one hand went up in the back. That one heard. <laughs> well, anyway... We have a very intriguing subject, uh, one that has a tremendous foundation in comparative religion and in comparative philosophy. As we realize, the doctrine of reincarnation was not part of the equipment of the Western thinker in ancient times. It apparently originated in the Trans Himavat in northern India and gradually drifted southward through most of Asia, finally into Egypt and Greece, and now into the Western Hemisphere. Actually, the doctrine of metempsychosis was comparatively recent in its Western acceptance. Up to the time of Homer, the Greeks had no sense of an afterlife. They had no idea of what was going to happen to the human soul after death. To cover this general ignorance, they had the belief or concept that after death, the ghost of the dead wandered forever in the ghostly corridors of the underworld, neither punishment nor reward, leading to the statement that is very famous, famous in Greek literature, namely, the poorest slave alive was more fortunate than great Achilles dead. There was no reward for valor, no punishment for crime. Now at that time, probably about oh, a thousand or more B.C., there was, there was very little opportunity for cultural growth because we find from studying comparative religion that the development of man's concept of immortality is essential to the progress of civilization. Where it does not exist, there is a frustration which extends into the life of the individual, even though it may be concerned primarily with the after-death experience. If there is nothing after death, there is really no reason for life. This puts the materialist at a great disadvantage. Materialism is a never a solution to anything. Reminding of, reminded of two scientists standing beside the casket of one of their illustrious brothers who is lying waiting for the final interment. One says to the other, well, he's all dressed up, but he has no place to go. <laughs> and this has been the frustration of materialism. No matter how wealthy a person becomes, how much power he attains, how popular he is, how deep an impression he may leave upon society, what does it all mean if it ends in nothing for him? He will not even be able to remember that he was fortunate or unfortunate. This may be a relief for few, but for the most is a great disillusionment. So until there was some concept of life after death, there was really no way of building a moral or ethical code of life. And Europe was comparatively late in coming into this realization. For Western Europe was still in a barbaric condition, probably still dwelling in caves, while the Chinese were writing libraries. The reason for this was that the flow of the cultural life moved northward from the Himavat, down across the plateaus of India, finally along caravan routes to every other part of Europe and Asia and along the caravan routes with the merchants 
came the philosophies of the East. The first in the West to really take on the problem seriously was Pythagoras of Samos. Uh, Pythagoras visited India, studied there, and is known in India even now as the Ionian master. He received much of the esoteric lore of India, all that they felt could be imparted to a stranger. And among other ideas that he gained there was this ideal or this principle of personal immortality. Now, even in Greece, of course, after this revelation, which came about 600 B.C., there was a division of opinion, just as there is here. And for a long time, this difference of opinion was never reconciled. In the beginning, the Greek culture was such that the Pythagoreans had to keep their knowledge of Eastern mysticism to to themselves. They had to form secret assemblies for its perpetuation, for it was contrary then to the prevailing tempo of the time. So the doctrine of reincarnation, while it was taught by Pythagoras, was carefully veiled and not generally acknowledged to the average person. At the time of Plato, of course, he places into the mouth of Socrates uh, the uh, concepts that motivated this great Athenian as he drank the hem- hemlock to die in Athens. Socrates was not executed for a crime. He was executed because he refused to pay a small fine by admitting that he was guilty of anything. So he chose death to paying the fine. And while his disciples were gathered about him, he said, don't worry too much. I'm really getting the better part of the deal. I, the convicted, am going to leave here very shortly now. But those who convicted me must suffer with material existence for a number of years to come. In other words, Socrates felt that he was out of a bad bargain. At that time also, he said, There is only two possible answers uh, to life after death. He said, either I go to sleep forever, and there is no more Socrates, not even a dream, not a nightmare, not a shadow. I am no more. Or else, I do not go to sleep forever. And when I get to the other side of life, I find myself in another universe, a universe I have sought for years to study here. But actually, one can never know till they get where it is. In the other side, if there is something after death, I may find answers to the great questions I have sought all my life, not only concerning myself, but the common good. Now, this was the way the Greeks took the situation at that time. Now, in uh, Asia, where reincarnation was generally accepted at a much earlier date, we find a careful consideration of the elements involving this doctrine. And as it descended through the Iranian-Aryan migrations, it mingled its own beliefs with a whole group of folk laws and folk religions all over the world. And it became a fixture added to something else. A good example of that, of course, is Christianity. Up to a comparatively recent date, Christianity gave no consideration to the possibility of reincarnation. It was contrary to all the beliefs. And then gradually a certain group of people began to make a wedge and inserted this doctrine without taking away any of the essentials of their previous beliefs. So we find gradually evidence also in the scriptures that this belief in reincarnation had reached the Near East and North Africa, certainly as early as the time of Alexandria, uh, but was not generally discussed, and every effort was made to prevent its dissemination by the rise of the early church. So we had the doctrine held in secret, a doctrine believed by a few, sworn to discretion, for fear of bringing upon themselves a tremendous persecution. 
Now, why would anyone want to persecute a person believe, for believing in immortality? Well, there are possibilities in many ways, especially the doctrine of reincarnation, because it interfered with the rather simple but inadequate doctrine of heaven and hell. It was no longer a case where the good went to heaven and the bad went to hell. For in this case, it was decided that among human beings, there were very few worthy of either termination. They actually were somewhere in a middle distance, too bad to go to heaven, too good to go to hell. Something had to happen to them. And the answer gradually emerged from the Greeks and later from other European sources and also from the mystery societies that originated in Asia, that actually the only place where an individual could fulfill his destiny is here where he started it. What is the solution to a life that is cut down in the midst of its action? The criminal is killed or kills himself to escape the consequences of his own misdeeds. The virtuous individual dies among his relatives and the hopes for a better life to come. But all of these circumstances are depending upon something else. Where from here? What happens after it's all over here? Well, if there is an evolutionary plan, if there is an educational system in the divine consciousness, if we are here for a purpose, if we are fashioned for a reason, if it was intended that we accomplish something, the plan didn't work very well. The individual suddenly finds that he came without knowing why, and he goes not knowing where. In the meantime, he has made some mistakes, gained a little intelligence, had made a few conscious corrections of his own nature, and developed a few new uh, uh, moral improprieties, and all this, uh, he suddenly lies down and departs. What happens to all that is inside of him? What happens to Socrates when the body goes? Is he likely to choose to drift off somewhere among the ghosts or even among the spirits? Why is, any, why is anyone going to go who is unfinished? And is there anyone finished? This was one of the problems that affected a great many philosophic thinkers. There seemed to be no answer to the reason why the individual, in his three score years and ten, maybe advanced as much as five score years now, but he comes imperfect and he departs imperfect. If there is any perfection, it's not here yet for the average human being. And if one with extraordinary virtues comes along, we punish them severely. So the problem answers, if the business is unfinished and it started here, why else should it end? The answer would seem to be here. Wherever problems are caused, they should be solved. Whatever we are here to learn, if we do learn it, it should be of some use. If we become very thoughtful and careful in this life, are we going to sleep with those who never gave life a thought? If we kept careful control of our negative attitudes, what good does it do? The virtuous and the vice-ridden go down to sleep together. And the uh, proof for uh, reward is inadequate. You certainly cannot expect an individual to be rewarded merely because he joins a church. He has to be some consequent of incident within himself. He has to earn a better life. And to learn a better life, we would see, we would have to learn it where he lives. Because we have no proof that he can learn a better life in some place that is not here. Furthermore, if he departs from here, what use is the experience he's had here? If he goes to an entirely different condition, then what, do, what does he gain? Why is it all necessary? And little by little, people began to think this through. And out of it came a rather careful consideration of the concept of re-embodiment, of an embodiment of, of consequences, 
that karma operating as the law of compensation is keeping charge of the individual. We are all in school. And if in school we flunk a course, we have to come back and do it again. And we will generally keep on flunking it until we pass. And this seems to be the way life is built here. We cannot condemn an individual but for a single failure. We cannot convict, convict the ignorant for not knowing what the wise know. We cannot convict individuals born in various circumstances beyond our understanding for mistakes that we might not make but they naturally will make. So out of it all, it seems that the only answer is to come back and finish the business where it started. This being considered reasonable, where do we go to get more information on the subject? Well, probably the best place to go for it is the place it came from, and that is the great stream of tradition that has descended from the mysteries of the past and worked its way across the world for nearly a million years. A tremendous concept of existence. Now this mainstream, of course, had to mingle with all the local folklore, folk religions, local beliefs, the magic and taboos of primitive peoples, the speculations of sophisticates. All these had to be included among those who needed this doctrine. And so the processes of filtrating it into the life of modern man has been for the most part benevolent and successful. So it comes to the more Im immediate moral consequence. The individual today, we all know, is a compound creature. He consists not only of a body, but of a mind, a soul, a consciousness, a spirit. There is something inside of him that is more than the body. Now, when that something inside of the individual departs therefrom, we have no reason to assume that life dies because the body does. We know that there are various circumstances that moderate bodily survival. In this material world, the pressures of circumstance, especially from the outside, or reactions to circumstances from the inside make it virtually impossible for the physical body to endure indefinitely. It is worn out by the frictions of physical relationships. It is worn out by the pressures of wars, disasters, plagues, poverty, crime. The whole material world gradually wears out, but for the individual. But there is no reason to assume that the life in the individual dies with the body. If the, if the life dies with the body, we have a total zero for everything. There is nothing more, nothing less. Whatever we did learn is meaningless. Whatever we should have learned is meaningless. And there is no chance to improve the situation. But with the doctrine of reincarnation or rebirth, we discover or decide that the human being divides essentially in two parts that part which is mortal and that part which is immortal. The immortal part is vested in a mortal fabric, but this vesting can be separated. It is quite possible for the immortal part to survive the disintegration of mortality. Of course, there is a little comfort in some of the things that we find in records of history. We know there are cases in which apparently a person has totally died and after several days or several weeks has come back to life. And nearly always the story is the same. What happened to them was completely different from anything in their material existence. But that part of the story is very much the like everywhere. Of course, you can bring against this the argument that as long as there was capacity to come back, death was not total. This problem has, of course, interested and influenced a great many thinkers in this particular field of research. But for all intent and practical purposes, 
we choose to believe that the divine part in us which was derived from God is not mortal and therefore cannot die. If there is an immortal part it must either survive or it must return to the God from which it came. The individual cannot with uh, a clear conscience assume that the spiritual values, the divine principles that exist in nature and in himself cease utterly and that the labor of creating a human being, the most elaborate structure nature has ever been able to create among mortal things, that this is to be disintegrated after a relatively short time and not a vestige remains. It seems therefore wiser to assume, as it has been assumed in Asia and in Egypt and in many parts of Europe, that there are two bodies also. And in this we come very close to the philosophy of Emerson and Thoreau. Emerson was quite aware of the fact that there has to be two kinds of bodies. One is a body of mortality. That is the body that goes with death. It includes the physical nervous system, the vital body, certain parts of the emotional nature, and the lower mind. When this is stripped off, however, the reality is not affected in any way. With the, with the death of the body, the reality in man never dies. That which survives then retires into a subjective state. Now the condition of this subjective state and its locale has been, these have been considered in many ways by different people. The tendency, however, today is to believe that survival is by the individual retiring into the eternal part of himself from which he cannot die. Therefore, instead of thinking of him primarily as going someplace outside, thinking of having another stellar summer land where he can drift around while he is out of the body, the wisest of thinkers in these directions assume that he retires into himself. And as he retires into himself and leaves the body behind, he finds that he is retiring into something infinitely greater than the body that he left behind. That here in within himself are all the principles, all the causes, all the elements that explain his mortality. Here are the sources of every impulse, every attitude. Here also is a great building plan, a spiritual architecture, by means of which the divine creator molds the inner life of the individual by a series of sequent embodiments. So if we wish to assume for the moment that we are not going to cause an overflowing of the conditions in the afterlife, we are not going to suddenly find ourselves in a condition that is going to be worse than 47th Street and 5th Avenue in New York. We are not going to be part of an ever-increasing mass of the dead. We are not going to go on forever, increasing the numbers on the other side. Because the other side, as we begin to investigate more deeply, is the inner side. The side that, strangely enough, unfolds into a universe almost as great as space itself. The inner life of the individual is infinitely greater, infinitely more important than the physical life. But in this inner life, there are experienced problems. The inner life is growing through the outer. It is growing in the sense it is transforming potentials into potencies. It is transforming the ideas of reality into the exact acts of reality. Therefore, Lord Bacon summarized this process as one of the four great keys. In other words, experience. Experience is the proof of all things. Experience in science is called experiment. And in man's inner life it is called growth. So man in his search for realities, uh, retiring into his own nature, 
discovers to his amazement that he is the captain of his own soul. He has the power to make the decisions that are important. He has debts to pay that he must pay. He has new plans to make that he will make. He has searching for greater understanding of the realities of things, an understanding that for a time at least he must gain through contact with material existence. So to the ancient people, re-embodiment was a continuation of a process of schooling. It was the individual gradually coming to master the manifestations of his own nature. He was here to grow, and growth is simply the release of the inside. Growth is not the result of eating more. Growth is the result of becoming more through the development of inner life. And spiritual integrities and many symbols represent the wonderful elixir of life, the universal medicine by which finally all the restrictions, limitations, and imperfections of human nature are reconciled. So if we are the master of our own soul, and if we are not, who is responsible for us? Are we to assume that God is responsible for our mistakes? Are we to assume that we were born imperfect by a divine edict? Or do we wish to assume that there is no guidance to prevent us from going wrong whenever weakness of temperament steps in? The answer is no. It is much more complicated than that, and yet infinitely simple. The whole problem is to become gradually, happily adjusted to the inner life. The individual must gradually know that the sole purpose is the soul, and that in this realization he gradually enters into communion with the greatest part of his self. So having this thought in the base of, of his mind, he begins to recognize that it may be covered by various veils for a long time, but whatever it is and wherever it is, it will be always the gradual release of the inner through the outer. If this release is too fast, it will destroy the outer. A great many people trying to do metaphysical exercises for development develop rates of vibration that destroy their lives, giving them sickness and mental and emotional imbalance. You have to grow naturally. Growth is something that physically is one of a biological process and metaphysically is a psychological process. But it is something that has to develop quietly and it is something that has to be supported by a greater and greater insight and understanding of the circumstances involved in the life pattern of every living thing. If the in inner life grows naturally, that means that the person is, in, is developing the integrities uh, that will make possible the release of the inner life. Now these integrities are covered by such disciplines as the Ten Commandments, or the Eight Commandments of Buddhism for temporal persons, or for the words of Christ, or for the teachings of Muhammad. All of these teachings of a moral and ethical nature are intended to enrich the individual's realization of universal truths. If he keeps the Ten Commandments, the lower part of his life becomes purified, redeemed, and regenerated. The more perfectly he lives here, the more he keeps the rules, the more the soul inside is able to move outward. Therefore, the moral integrities have as their basis the conduct of the individual and as their consequences the release of the inner life. Now, if the release of the inner life starts fairly well, we know that uh, in the midst of it we're going to be cut down. War comes. Pestilences hit us. Earthquakes destroy things, famines, all these things, and wherever else fails, disease and sickness move in. There seems to be no way to perpetuate the body beyond a certain point. The actual fact seems to be, at least, that when the inner life realizes that the inner life's needs are no longer possible to the body, then the inner life begins to retire from the body. When this is in a normal and natural way, it is not a great disaster. But to those who have not produced or not understood 
or have not an inner light to strengthen them. All things that are unpleasant are disasters. So after having come to this point, we will say for the moment that a soul, a being, has gone into the other life and is more or less faced by the intricate machinery of its own morality. The individual begins to understand the relationship between a divine reality and a human unreality. The entity begins to realize a little bit of why it was born in the left in the body it has just left behind. It was born because of unfinished business. It was born because it has not outgrown the restrictions which are imposed upon mortal creatures. Therefore, in a period when gradually the lower vehicles of embodiment are dispensed, gradually, little by little, the vital, vital body is returned to the vital fountains of life. The emotional body returns to the emotional realms from which the substance of which all such bodies are fashioned. And the mental body disintegrates or vanishes back into the universal mind. That which is left, however, is soul awareness. Then, perhaps for the first time in a cycle of embodiment, the inner life and the outer life have a strange kind of meaning. Before the ego, personal self, fades away, it becomes suddenly aware of the reason for itself. It suddenly becomes aware of the destiny for which it was intended. And in that vision, which arises from internal recollection rather than from external preachments, the individual suddenly realizes his place in the plan. He knows why he went through what he did go through. He knows why there is more yet to be done. Now, in the very primitive eras of our evolution, and among the less evolved people even now, this after-death circumstance is considerably shortened. It is very little uh, to be used for rational purposes. The individual is a child, like a school child, who died before it got out of kindergarten. Therefore, a great deal of the material with which the more evolved person has to deal with does not confront this other individual. But he is not considered, or nor is he, impoverished for lack of it. He is part of the same cycle, but the winds are tempered to the shorn lamb. That which the individual does not know and cannot know, he is not held responsible for. But he is also on the same ladder, gradually climbing, gradually rising, day by day, and we see how vital this is today in our world affairs. We are living in a world now that is filled with pain. It is filled with all kinds of perversities, exiles, victims, prisoners, martyrs. These are all common things. And yet in the great plan of things, there cannot be any real evil. All these things are part of a karmic reaction upon body. But the life blocked within that body is immortal, eternal, and inevitably destined to be perfect. And that is just as true of the most humble, helpless, hungered, dying human being as it is of the greatest sage. And it is sometimes more true of those who in simple ways have done the best they could than the more advanced ones who have constantly compromised their convictions for the benefits of profit. But back now into the pattern. Here the individual faces his life. He sees, as is sometimes reported, of the dying person in the ocean, that in a moment his whole life passes before his eyes while he is drowning. Uh, the Pythagoreans had the same concept in their meditational disciplines. It was their labor every day to try to understand the meaning of what happened, why they were to blame for problems, how they could solve those problems, what they should have done instead of what they did do. And this type of discipline is much more valuable to the unfolding soul than some platitudes on a religious level. But in any way, the entity, now in its pure condition, living only as it is, 
its achievements and everything that are part of it. It looks down, perhaps, in some mysterious way, not in physical dimension, but in a certain psychological sense, and it sees where it came from. And it looks over itself as it might look over a stranger. And it looks over the self and he says, well, I didn't do too well. Uh, I could have done better. Maybe I could have done worse. But looking back in the, in the perspective, as the Pythagorean points out, the individual could see and can see what the consequences would have been had he made different decisions. If he had made decisions that did not violate law, he would have no karma to problem in. If he had uh, made those growth emotions uh, that nature intended, he would then move into the next higher step painlessly and without inconvenience. But every good thing has to struggle for life in this world, and corruption seems to be the favorite. But so this under uh, higher thinking, uh, the individual begins to contemplate his future existence. So, according to the uh, old teachings, the little souls do not contemplate. They take what comes next, because it is the only thing they can do. But there is nothing that happens to them next that is dangerous to their ultimate growth. It is that they have not yet awakened to the degree where they may make certain decisions for themselves. But as life evolves, as people grow, as the intensities of effort get greater, we find many divisions and levels of human beings. We find many who try very hard to do what is right. Some make mistakes. We also find many people who start out in life with noble purposes, but some old karma catches up with them and gives them a world of trouble. All around we see this process of growing, uh, which is, of course, a divine institution, for we are all in the school of the Holy Spirit. And having come to certain decisions, and having achieved at certain levels, and having advanced certain special forms of knowledge, as in law, or in medicine, or architecture, music, all these things, the entity... Uh, the subjective part of the individual that did not die with the body begins to realize that there are things that it needs to do and it needs to do them to take care of old business and it needs to do them to advance new business that is appropriate and necessary that gradually the entity itself becomes aware of its own place in the law of rebirth and karma and having attained to this degree, there is an increasing privilege of the entity or the soul itself to employ its own energies uh, to help this being to select a proper destiny. So if the individual has a bad karmic lesson, he might be an individual who avoided the karma from this or perhaps died and affected this release and thought it was over but it wasn't it's never over till the debt is paid but he looks and he says well uh, that looks like it's a little unfinished business that is going to hold me back that will always be there till I solve it I had a grudge against Jones I'll always have that grudge until I stop grudging he also says I always work too hard for profit and not enough for principle. It's about time to take these changes. Another says, I was selfish. I sacrificed the love of my family to some gain for myself. I owe my family a debt. And little by little, the entity can choose and often does choose at least part of the burden it is going to carry the next time it comes. Now, when it gets back in the body and faces what it chose, it may not be very happy about it. <laughs> it, is the, it is already no longer clear. It no longer sees everything. It is all covered and murky now, and there's nothing but an unpleasant situation. Now, again, that situation may be too much. The individual may not be able to face it. So he evades it again. 
But even if he evades it nine and ninety times, he will ultimately have to pay it. On the other hand, he will begin to learn that the things he does well have a great importance. We must realize in karma that it is not all punishment. It is consequence. It is reward. It is that which is the natural result of things done. A great deal of karma is very beautiful. We all have wonderful experiences which are the result of having earned them. Salvation must be earned. The Arabian Nights says happiness must be earned. In everything in life, the good must be earned. And we are always earning. But if we earn good, we are happy. If we earn evil, we are punished. But in every case, the earning is equal by what is earned. So if we have the right to say, we can say, well, I did pretty well in that last life, and uh, looking back over a half a dozen more, uh, I, I did fairly well. Well, I was respectable. Uh, but there were things that I never could see straight. And one of these and they all caused me to break up my home without realizing what I was doing. I thought I was right. But from this larger perspective, I see that I wasn't right. Well, I guess I'd better put another home on my list and try this time to do it right. So those who have reached a certain degree of growth have the privilege of a certain amount of selection in the things which they're going to do next. They have reached the point in their own development, however, by that time that will not permit them to keep on to choo choosing only what they like. They will choose what is next. And why, as a result of choosing what is next, they come back here in a very mixed condition. And the society as we know it and see it here today is a consequence from such a situation. We are here, we do not know why. The situations arise, we do not know why. We, we either do something with them or we fumble them badly, do not know why. And so it goes on until the next embodiment. But it is all in the end going to result in an individual who has become capable of universal experience, who has become capable of universal wisdom, and under so conditions becomes gradually and inevitably one of the great teachers of humanity, and also later it becomes the foundation of new worlds that we know nothing of. But all of it is growth, and it is all circumscribed by divine love. There is no hate in it anywhere. There is no injustice. The courts of men may fall and fail, but the courts of heaven never fail. And what we sometimes feel to be a tough deal, and it will be a tough deal from the limited experience factor of objectivity, but if we are able to go inside, we will find that it is a proper deal. Now, it is not necessary to always wait for the next embodiment to solve some of these problems that are still obscure. The only way to solve an outside problem is to go inside. Brute thoughts and argument does nothing. We have to go inside and in quietude call upon the best resources that we have to solve even the commonplace incidents of life. When the, uh, between incarna uh, can incarnations, it's the same thing. We are forever laboring to fulfill the destiny, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We have to do this because it is perfection only that is safe, not only for the individual but for society. All things must do it right or troubles will never end. Ulterior motives are the most dangerous things in the world. And there's nothing that can bring an individual back with a lot of unpaid bills than a series of ulterior motives while he is alive. Well, really all moral religions have to do with a code. The Ten Commandments and things like that. They try to teach people to be good enough to get along in a civilized relationship. They warn against all type of ordinary, ordinal sin. 
they help us to build a foundation for the improvement of life. And the doctrine of reincarnation does not interfere with any of these commandments because it requires them for the fulfillment of itself. It is only when the individual makes some type of dedication that he begins to grow. If he does not live a little better each life, there is a stagnation in nature. Actually, however, he can't be stagnant very long because in those intervals between embodiments, the message comes through loud and clear. He has to face it. And out of faith, having face it, facing it, he becomes a step further along the path of his own immortality. Now, some also have asked how long part of the great cycle of life. It was according to Pythagoras and most of the followers of the, of the Eastern schools that under normal conditions the individual is out of embodiment from 600 to 1200 years to, contain, to uh, accomplish two purposes. In the first place, there is a great importance which we seldom realize in the matter of re-embodiment to realize that we are coming back into another world. If we come back into the same environment we went out of, the situation is infinitely more difficult and sterile. But if there is a great time in which a whole major move of civilization must inevitably, ultimately be in the right direction, then the individual comes back on an uprising surge of progress, and it goes with it. But if he came back too soon for no good reason, he would not have this experience. There are many times also in which individuals, some, some special purpose or reason, may come back sooner. And there's also sometimes it has been estimated that certain of the sages of long ago would not be able to return to grow until the world catches up with things at 10,000 years from now. But they ultimately will have to grow some more. But they must wait until lessons they need come along. If they have met the lessons that they needed up to now, they come back when the next new lesson gives opportunity. They come back to fulfill the old and prepare for the new. Now, in the Buddhist Tattva doctrine in India, there is a very interesting idea, which I think may be worth a simple thought at this time. Uh, the, assuming that uh, these uh, Bodhisattvas are essentially enlightened beings, under the same laws that we are. There is no power that can break divine law, even God. Divine law is eternal. But in various times and various conditions, entities grow. And there's the story, of course, of the Bodhisattva, who is ready to depart. He had fulfilled all of the karma, he had paid every debt that he owed to society. There was no longer a bad sin holding him back or a worldly attitude to prevent his growth. And so, according to the legend, he stood on the edge of a great cliff that led out into the nirvana, the infinite, which, however, is not eternal. Nirvana is a state relating to growth within this world pattern. When this world period ends, there will be a new concept of, of reality. But anyway, this particular being standing there is supposed to have heard the cry of the dying bird. And as a result of that, a great mercifulness came over the being. And it took the vow that it would never go on and make that last final adjustment until it could take with it every other living creature. This was the great renunciation uh, in which a voluntary return to conditioned existence, although it has been outgrown, is part of the, of the real inner life of this world savior, the great sages, and the great teachers. They may have learned all there is to learn, but they cannot go because of a commitment inside themselves until they can share knowledge with every living creature. Now there's another interesting phase of this problem 
that most people don't realize or pay much attention to. And that is that every living thing is also object to these laws. The tree, the bird, the flower. Everything is subject to the law of cause and effect on its own level. It must experience that which is next for itself. We cannot judge these experiences. We do not know what hoot owls need next. We do not know whether the small tree needs a particular thing. But the infinite life of things knows what everything needs. And so we find the law of reincarnation is held wherever there are sentient beings. And therefore it is perfectly possible for animals to return also under the guidance and direction of their group spirit. For they have little lessons to learn. They have their way of unfolding the soul within them. For in the last analysis of things, the soul of the little bird is not less than the soul of man. All these things are growing under law, and that law is eternal love. But discipline is the only way in which that law can operate and can bring all things to the fulfillment of themselves. I don't think there is any virtue whatsoever in the individual trying to prepare in this world for reincarnation in the next. What he should do is not try to build a dream or a hope or meditate on or listen to something about a, a better future. We have to face two simple facts. The good future depends upon a good past. It depends upon solving the causes of a bad future. We know in ordinary court that dishonesty is usually punished, but we always hope that moral uh, dishonesty won't be noticed. We also sometimes take refuge in atheism, which of course is the very, very large problem of destroying everything in order to get rid of our own limitations. Whereas it is perfectly possible for us to grow and unfold and perfect all of these things. And so all creatures have this particular propensity. They come back, they learn their own curious little lessons. The baby rabbit learns from its mother. There are no words. It must watch. We have a mindful. It must crouch down when the mother crouches down. It must hop behind the bush when she does. These are the laws of survival in that world. But it is learning. And everything that lives is learning. It is learning to love, it's learning to fear. But gradually all this learning results in the evolution of these creatures until they become much more and much greater beings than they were before. Now we might also take a moment to consider something. What about the end of all of this? We've decided that we are able to gradually come into complete adjustment with that part of ourselves which comes down into embodiment, the incarnating ego. We expect that the soul power coming through the ego will finally fulfill the need of a virtuous life. The dedications will grow and finally little by little the small debts of existence will be paid. Now what does this all mean in, in terms of the future? Suppose we get all these debts paid, what then? Well, there's all kinds of answers. The brief one, of course, is in theology that if we get everything right and everything is correct, then we go to heaven. But this is a little dim also. <laughs> and there's not too much enthusiasm generated by this thought. Uh, we would almost certainly exchange this prospect for a few more years of comfortable existence in this world. But in the philosophy of things is a very interesting thing because now we come into what you might call astral theology. Here we come into the great systems of the cosmos, the systems in which the whole universe and hundreds of other universes and great galaxies and solar systems and all kinds of phenomena in the universe which we cannot see but which was intuitively believed by some of the earlier uh, scientists such as uh, Pythagoras and Ptolemy of Alexandria. 
We live in a universe that is one vast organism, one tremendous power, uh, one great entity, and one of the, even beyond that, on, 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 beyond comprehension. We cannot go that far. But we are part of something that grows. We are a little bit reminded of the idea of the old businessman who trained his son to come after him in the business. And this is the same type of thing. We are all in training to take over our part of a bigger business. We are all here that, so that we can become powers in the unfoldment of greater systems of life. This little solar system, uh, uh, Mark Twain called it the wart. But this little solar system is just something out on the edge of the great universal system. Uh, one hardly noticeable. But here in the invisible life of, of the planet, it is making its part in its own growth. This planet will someday be a sun. And when, when it comes to this degree, it will have its own planets. And all those beings that grew up in it when it was an earth will go on become parts of something more noble, more beautiful, more wonderful. But there will always be learning, there will always be living, and there will always be loving. These are the great keys of eternity. And we may go through vast galaxies, through huge complexes of solar systems, and so finally we might say we come to the actual throne of the eternal. When we get there, we will know. Until then, we will not. But in every bit of growth, we're not just growing to get into this world and out, nor are we growing just to get a better adjustment in this world. We are growing to attain our citizenship in creation. Our citizenship in the great plan of things. And everyone is a citizen we may go jail a few times en route, but we will all be citizens in good standing. But nature will never let us rest until we are. So we might as well get used to the idea as soon as possible. And so we are all part of this great unfolding mystery. And according to the Oriental thinkers, someday each of us will be a solar system. Or more. We are now. We just don't know it. There are more parts in us now, more living things in us than on the planet. Millions of living things depend upon us to survive. And when we get mad, millions die of plague within our own flesh. We are growing up also as custodians of life. And wherever we make a false move intentionally, we have to pay. That false move is not going to be fatal. No one is going to be lost. There is no lost souls. There are only a few that are delayed a little longer than others because of the things that they do and the way they live, the way they think. But in the end, somewhere beyond is a tremendous blast of glory. Jacob Bemey, the German mystic, in two visions, had the experience of suddenly seeing the cosmos open. It was something so utterly unbelievable that he could hardly breathe. He never could describe it any more than he could put down its details. But it was a tremendous, infinite reality from which we are locked by the restrictions of our sensory perceptions and the deficiencies of our integrities. But out there is where we're all going, because none of us can die. We can have all kinds of false attitudes on the subject. We can believe anything we want to, but the truth is, we are all eternal. Having come out as sparks from an infinite flame, we go on forever. And, the, and gradually, as we go, we create worlds. We create new orders of life. Here in this little world, we have inventors, we have artists, we have those who work for all kinds of constructive enterprises, and we have a, an educational system that is a shadow, a very faint shadow of the reality. 
This educational system starts us out in kindergarten. And I think we're going to have a major improvement any moment now because we're going to have two years in kindergarten instead of one, according to the new educational structure. But in the kindergarten, where a great many still are, we have uh, the beginning of an education. And what is that purpose of that education? That we can learn to read and write. That we can gradually come to the point where we can become independent living creatures. Take care of ourselves, accept responsibilities, and contribute to the common good. So we finally graduate cum laude from kindergarten and go into the grade schools. Here we go on grade by grade till we get to the junior high. And whenever we graduate from something, there's great rejoicing. Then we go on a little further, and we land in the university. So we go there, and we learn something else, usually about the thing we want to do, a thing we want to know more about. There's just one little weakness in this situation that I think someday, not too long from now, may be corrected. There, might, there should be a great university system that teaches us where we are really going that opens to us the realization of a future infinitely greater than any physical institution can bestow. But anyway, we go on. We learn a profession or craft or a trade, and we become Bachelor of Arts or something. Then if we're going on a little further, we take the master's degree, and finally, if we are able to survive it, we reach the, we reach the doctorate. And then having reached the doctorate, we are then supposedly at the head of our educational system and are supposedly able to make a living. This is not always certain, however. <laughs> also, what we can study and how we can study it are all controlled by highly opinionated people. But the theory is the same, basically. Namely, that we're all going through the grades of the school of the Holy Spirit. We are all a part of an educational system that began so far back we can't even imagine it and will go on into the future so far we can't imagine that either. But we are in a perpetual process of growing. And this is not going to be terrible. It's not going to also make us sophisticated or give us false pride or make us feel better than other people. All growth is for a purpose. You can go to law school and become a lawyer. You can go to medical school and become a doctor. But these are all material things. The, the great school of the universe is going to make us something else. It is not going to make us successful in this world, necessarily. But in that school, we learn the mysteries of heaven, of eternal life, and the fulfillment of all good that is possible. That gradually, by degrees, and in our own time, and in our good way, we shall become truly citizens of the universe full citizenship with voting power here we vote for some kind of a physical candidate and afterwards wish we hadn't <laughs> there we become part of a citizenship that gives us a right to participate in eternal growth and eternal life where we will all find we are in, a, in more than a democracy we will be in a great world in which we will be all part of one gigantic family in which everyone works for all. And as soon as that process is achieved, the miracles will go beyond all imagination. For the great miracles are in space, and we're not going to cross them with spaceships. We're not going to get anywhere by trying to find out whether there's anything but broken rock on Mars. This is not the answer. We are in a tremendous living universe. We are in a world of infinite potential. We are in a world that goes on beyond the dreams of the most vivid imagination. And we're going to someday be people who will be proud of themselves. But by that kind, we won't care whether we're proud or not. You'll be busy doing the things that are next. Now, if therefore we are working with the idea of, of karma and reincarnation. Let's get right down to the little ordinary worldly situations we face. Let's try to realize that sometime we're going to have to meet all the unfinished business of our lives. 
we're going to have to face up to the things that we avoid and evade. We are going to have to find that we cannot afford a quarrel. We cannot afford to, to cheat someone else. We cannot afford to hate. All these things are something we just simply can't afford. And there is no evasion of them under the normal way in which we live. A very interesting story comes out on that from one of the discourses of Buddha. It seems that once upon a time a great general who was the head of the armies to defend a native ruler went to Buddha and said, I have taken an oath to defend my king and my country. And if there is war, I have an oath that I must win that war if I can. And yet you tell me that I must not kill. What is the answer? The Buddha looked at him for a couple of moments. He said, You swore the allegiance to your king. When you did that, you did not realize that you were taking on karma. Karma. If it is necessary for you to keep your rule and this war and you kill, then you must pay that debt in the future. It is part of the, uh, of the obligation you take when you accept the leadership of his armies. The act that you win the war is not the answer. Any destructive act for any reason has to be paid. But if you do it because you are do, uh, dedicated to a principle or to a person, then you must realize that you have that as a karma. In other words, you cannot serve this other person without paying for that service if it demands misdeed. That's a pretty strict rule. But it is part of the way we all have to look at these things one of these days. So we have to work in our way, Pythagoras started it, with the disciplines. The discipline of retrospection. The individual sitting down and living his day well, uh, when night comes, rather than waiting to live it after death. If we can put our books in order before we go, we don't have to struggle with them afterwards. But they must be put in order. And the only way in which we can add to our growth in good karma is that we have paid off the debt, which is debt. Karma cannot be subsidized or changed, but it can be pre gradually prevented if we find out the things which it would teach us otherwise. If we are angry and continue to allow the body to be afflicted by various ailments, high blood pressure, etc., arising from anger, we must face it. If we decide to go in for uh, narcotics and we kill ourselves that way, we have to face it. If we, in the, all these things that we do must be ultimately worked out. And the things that we do one by one, we must work out, every one. So if we can, by some good measure, limit the negative factors of our daily living, then we have an opportunity to give added emphasis, growth, and release to the good parts by which our growth is assured. We can grow directly by doing it right, rather than grow indirectly by doing it wrong and learning the lesson. In other words, we are able to do many things every day to help us to meet the challenge of transition. If we do this, we find in gradually that our condition is markedly improved. Uh, Pythagoras was able to help his disciples to weed out all kinds of little inconsistencies, little absurdities of action and conduct, little ulterior motives that crept in. All kinds of weaknesses and failings can be weeded out by retrospection, by the possible use of the fa rational faculty to learn the lesson without waiting for the, punish for the punishment to come. If we can do that, we are, we are going to be very much uh, better off than we would otherwise be. 
because we will be growing, growing every day of our lives. Also, there are other things to bear in mind as we go along. And that is the possibility of adding daily to good karma. We can we make mistakes and every day we add a little to the negative side. Therefore, it is good to make something unusually right and add in that way uh, to the good side. Every good deed is a mysterious power to carry us further on the great growth problems of life. So we better do it if we possibly can. Now also there's the uh, eternal uncertainty uh, that affects us all and that has to do with whether or not there is such a thing as evil. Uh, uh, Paracelsus was not likely to affirm it. To him evil was like a miracle. A miracle is simply a manifestation of universal law. Evil is a manifestation of universal law. There is no devil. The devil is not there at all. Devil is that which hurts when we do it wrong. Some little boys were talking one day, and one had come out of Sunday school. He said to the other, Do you believe in the devil? The other, who was two years older and therefore much more sophisticated, uh, replied, No, I don't. The devil is a, like Santa Claus. It's your father. <laughs> well, that's the way it is anyway. But there is no such a thing as a spirit of evil. Goethe tells us that when he introduces us to Mephisto. Part of the power that still works for good while ever scheming ill. In other words, the temptation is something created to be resisted. But most people prefer to let it happen. And so we find all kinds of side lights from ancient religions and philosophies trying to dramatize uh, the various phases and reincarnation hitting different nations at different times in history and all kinds of folk lore and folk legendary takes on a variety of colorings but an essential principle it is always the same it is that part of the great journey in the mystery systems the great journey was from here to there and uh, Plotinus who was one of the greatest of the Neoplatonic mystics pointed out that the great journey is of the lonely to that which is alone and uh, we are all moving towards something bigger and in order to do that we cannot carry all the ballast of our previous mistakes with us we have to grow and we're here to grow and it can be a very pleasant thing and if it isn't pleasant enough I think you may well wait because things are going to change a wee bit nature's plan is not going to change because we mess things up the various situations we are getting ourselves into economics economically also has a karma our judgments have karma our banks have karmas our business organizations have them karmas are not limited entirely to living things they are limited to also to include policies, patterns, purposes, judgments, intentions, and everything which qualifies life. Anything through the action of which brings sorrow, pain, or suffering will have to pay for it. And a system that is corrupt will have to pay for it. This can nothing really win in the long analysis. Nothing can actually become the fullness of itself until step by step it returns to integrity and this is the integrity we all must have so reincarnation can apply to almost any situation that arises wherever there is intemperance there is retribution wherever there is unfortunate policy there is consequence all the wars and dissensions and problems of today are karmic and I'm making more karma. They will have to keep on going through these cycles until we realize 
that we live in the universe which will never accept from us anything except integrity everything else will be penalized and the longer we delay and the greater the mistakes the more difficult the penalties will be but no penalty will destroy us no penalty can affect the individual who doesn't deserve it and the penalty itself must be paid but it will never cost the life the individual will always win in the long run but in some cases we are beginning to realize that the run is too long so we have to build new governments new laws new ways of life nearer not only to our heart's desire but nearer to the divine purpose if we do these things wisely and lovingly we will realize that rebirth is a great wonderful possibility it is the law that makes all things grow to the fulfillment of themselves and it is also the absolute promise of absolute and ultimate immortality for everything including the small bug on the in the sunbeam it is all part of eternal life eternally unfolding and with those thoughts i think we all can kind of fit into the idea of reincarnation regardless of our other religious affiliations thank you